Welcome, everyone. <clears throat> I'm Dan Borelli, Director of Exhibitions at the Graduate School of Design. I'd like to begin this afternoon's events by acknowledging that the Harvard Graduate School of Design is located on the traditional and ancestral land of the Massachusetts, the original inhabitants of what is now known as Boston and Cambridge. We, the GSD, pay respect to the people of the Massachusetts tribe, past and present, and honor the land itself, which remains sacred to the Massachusetts people. I also want to honor and recognize the Harvard University Native American program for their work cultivating the relationships that lead to the creation of this acknowledgement. I'm with you today from Framingham, Massachusetts, the traditional ancestral land of the Nipmuc, and I pay my respects to the people, past and present, of Nipmuc Nation. Welcome, everyone. And now for today's event, we mark a public conversation around two Harvard exhibitions. At the Harvard Art Museums, the exhibition, Christoph Wodichko Portrait, open now until April 17th, 2022. And at the GSD, Interrogative Design, Selected Works of Christoph Wodichko, open now until February 20th, 2022. These exhibitions organized jointly by the Harvard University Graduate School of Design and the Harvard Art Museums are made possible by the, possible by the Graham Gunn Exhibition Fund, Gallery Lalonde and Company, and the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden. We would like to thank the director of the Harvard Art Museums, Martha Tedeschi, and our own Dean, Sarah Whiting, for their continuing support of this project. I would like to also acknowledge uh, Mary Schneider Enriquez, the Houghton Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art at the Harvard Art Museums. Mary and I have worked together on this particular subject of, of Christoph for a couple of years now. And during the evolution of this, when I started to come to uh, think about how to curate an exhibition on Christoph's work, I wanted to start by acknowledging that we're a teaching institution first and foremost. I wanted to showcase his drawings not for a romanticized view, but to evidence Christoph's creative process that is drawings that explore and drawings that explain. And when I had this conversation with Christoph, he said, but I don't draw to make art. My, my drawings are not art. So show, only show them in reproductions and you should contact my gallerist, Mary Sabatino. And when I did, Mary said, whatever you do, show the originals. Don't let him show you reproductions. And so I want to thank Mary Sabatino and Gallery Lalong for an incredibly gracious uh, amount of original drawings and other artifacts that comprise this exhibition, including the Hirshhorn Museum's homeless vehicle variant, which will be discussed in this afternoon's session. I'd like to also acknowledge and thank the entire GSD communications department and our GSD exhibitions team. Um, this was our first major install since we came together after the building uh, opened up to our, our community only. And it has been challenging to come back together and work together. Uh, but as we are a teaching institution first, currently the exhibition is open to Harvard ID access only. Uh, we're hoping that we can open it up broader to the general public after January 1st, 2022. So we asked you to check online during that time. But while you're online, we are also each week featuring a project or two of Christoph's much further in depth, um, showing original videos, uh, installation shots. And we have begun the process of conducting video interviews of Christoph himself, and those will also be forthcoming. So for this afternoon's um, panel, I'd like to introduce our two participants, Rosalind Deutsch. She's an art historian and critic who teaches modern and contemporary art at Barnard College, Columbia University in New York City. And she'll be in a direct conversation with our own Christoph Wodichko, professor in residence of art design in the public domain at the Graduate School of Design at Harvard. So I wanna welcome Rosalind and Christoph. Thank you, Dan. I want to um, thank you for inviting me to participate in this event. I'm very happy to be here and to celebrate Christoph. 
Um, I also want to thank Kat and Matt and um, Paige for helping me, uh, you know, being very efficient and helping me uh, deal with images and technology and other things like that. I'm glad to see. Oh, well, there uh, you are. Rosalind, <laughs> uh, we've been uh, a companion and comrades for such a long time, <laughs> but this is the first time we were uh, separated by the screen and also joined by a large number of people remotely. Um, so thank you, uh, of course, Dan Borelli, for uh, your art of exhibition. And uh, I just hope that uh, sometime in January or in mid-February, this show will be open so we can meet there and actually uh, look closer at those drawings, which you done introduced uh, already, but also to see some objects, one of which is a uh, homeless vehicle, but also a police car. Um, well, those two seem to have very close connection with the title of the show, the interrogative design. Uh, oh. So I uh, don't know, uh, but uh, of course I learn a lot, Rosalind, from you about <laughs> the way I, uh, you know, I, I understand uh, the operation of this vehicle in its utopian uh, way. But, um, it, it, you know, I have some slides I could show if that's appropriate or you, Rosalind, perhaps you could say something first. Yeah, I was going to start out by asking you something about interrogative design, the concept and term, because it is the um, title of the exhibition where it's being applied to the entirety of your work, although I think it was originally used for a very specific part of your practice, the, um, you know, the design of instruments and equipment for the homeless and for homeless people and also for immigrants afterwards. So I was just going to ask you, um, first of all, to just talk about what you mean by this term, interrogative design. Sorry, my phone is ringing and it'll stop in a minute. This is, I'm at home. Um, so, um, you know, I thought maybe you could talk about the origins and the definition of the term and particularly the meaning of- Hello, good afternoon. This is Ellen Jane's Lion Service. Concerning I'm so sorry. For Monday, we are shut zero. Our tech will be there between nine and 12. Thank you. I tried to have that turned off, but it didn't work. I'm really sorry. Um, okay, so I, uh, especially the term interrogative, um, what's being interrogated, who's being invited to interrogate. Um, yes, yeah, so let's start off with those questions. Well, um, I'm, uh, by my uh, professional upbringing, and some kind of utopian uh, commitment, industrial designer. So I was educated in this field. And uh, of course we were very much into uh, making, like resolving issues or responding to problems in order to find a solution. So the solution seemed to be the, the most frequent word used in that industrial design community. But it's clear that uh, uh, well, there are problems that need to be much more complex approach and uh, design often cannot find a solution. I was, uh, uh, when I came from Canada to the United States, that was 100,000 homeless people in New York City. So clearly, uh, no design solution was found <laughs> when I was there. Oh, there were probably uh, serious matters to be resolved first, such as socioeconomic system 
that was uh, uh, dysfunctional or functioning in a very destructive way during the time of Reagan. Uh, you know, that, that in itself uh, reinforced my doubts about the, 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 the possibility of resolving everything through design. Actually, the questions became more important than answers. Recognizing the situation of such uh, was more important for me than finding quick fa facade of a solution behind which you will camouflage the problem. So the design uh, also brings the question, in our first question into something to interrogate, uh, how can design respond to the needs that should not exist in civilized world? Yet they do exist, no matter how much we don't want to see them, they do exist and people are dealing with those needs. They are they're in needless needs and, and they have to respond to those needs the way they can with their ha bare hands, like homeless people, by uh, using those uh, vehicles, carts, uh, appropriate uh, equipment, seen as scavengers, uh, of people who are stealing something, uh, rather than as legitimate workers, people who contribute, in fact, to, to some degree to the economy and well-being of the city and environment by collecting bottles, cans, and um, plastic, metal, uh, uh, and, uh, and glass. So that means my response was create emergency uh, equipment, uh, but overloaded with the functional program to the point that the equipment will carry on uh, all of those needs, those functions that should not exist in the world. So those two, two elements together um, and maybe deserve like a hope, the term interrogative. And so it's both intervention and, uh, and questioning. In fact, it suggests that we're dealing with criminal situation, with, with something that needs to be investigated. The criminal situation was described by many people, including you, Roslyn, but also Neil Smith and other people in our circle at that time. Uh, well, Neil Smith called uneven development which was uh, uh, clearly the process of a very rapid and uh, an asymmetrical development. So something was developed quickly, somebody else was evicted almost automatically, the same process. So the production of homelessness was connected with real estate development and gentrification, you know, fine arts of gentrification, as you pointed out, Rosalind. I'm glad you um, mentioned the uh, the notion of crime and of the interrogation being a critical uh, criminal investigation because and this came up in our conversation recently uh, we had a conversation preceding this conversation um, in which I asked you if you thought your works of interrogative design well meaning specifically the equipment for homeless people and immigrants, but maybe all of your work uh, has any similarity with forensic architecture, which is a group based in London at Goldsmiths, which um, uses innovative technology. So that's one similarity, I think, uses innovative technologies to investigate buildings and spaces to provide uh, evidence of crimes, war crimes in particular, crimes against humanity that can be used in, in the case of forensic architecture, of course, it's used in international tribunals and courts, which isn't the case with yours. But yeah. um, if conceptually you think there's a similarity. <laughs> yeah. uh, definitely, there is a connection here. Of course, the method is different. Uh, this more on, of investigation uh, in, uh, forens forensic architecture is focusing on investigation by re, um, trying to reconstruct, I understand, 
uh, well, the, 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 the criminal, uh, the crime that was committed by uh, focusing on sites, on all of the logistics and kind of from the, 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 the site of damage or destruction, go back to all of the, the history that led and other conditions. I think it's very, it is very, very clear uh, uh, similarity. But of course, uh, here I'm introducing the kind of probing uh, vehicle, <laughs> something that is uh, like a dispatched to pen, to uh, to uh, visualize, to to somehow art articulate, or also to create a point, converging point of debate and discussion. So in this intervention here, it's not simply by uh, by presenting a sculptural object that contains all of those uh, elements of truth, truth uh, uh, of 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 technical technique of of survival of people, with all of the details, but also it it, it creates uh, conditions for the operator to become uh, a, a presenter. And someone who explains, someone who uh, illuminates the minds of people about the history of his or her own uh, life that led to this situation of being homeless, and also uh, explaining with details why this or that particular thing is designed this way, well, what this is for, you know, and uh, what, what, how much it costs, how many of them might be when be produced. And uh, there's so much uh, questions being asked. Uh, so the vehicle is actually provoking the questions, inspiring the questions, and, uh, and also inviting uh, kind of very confrontational uh, exchange, exchange of, of points of view. So it's very kind of uh, discursive, if not agonistic in its effect. So of those uh, effect of this vehicle in terms of social effect, discursive effect, was a surprise to me. It was a surprise to me to the point that I realized that the vehicle cannot fulfill, cannot respond to the avalanche of various situations that it provokes because it doesn't have certain capacities that should have. So in a way, the criticism of this vehicle for its insufficiency that surprised me also, you know, led to other projects, interrogative projects, especially in the area of media. Now, this vehicle didn't have communication media, didn't have a memory, uh, kind of electronic memory, could not really, uh, did not, it was just a, a, an object, a functional object that helped the person operating it and everybody around to argue around it and discuss it and reveal the reasons, so-called reasons, why this vehicle was designed this way. But however, the, what this person could say about own life to people you know, could be reinforced by, by some uh, technology. So, uh, oh, so anyway, uh, it was definitely uh, working and in a way it was not produced, uh, but it was reproduced by media uh, with all kinds of stories and discussions, interpretations. So in fact, it extended its, its life through media. Well, as you're talking, I'm thinking that, um, first of all, the insufficiency of the vehicle was part of what you were trying to show, it seems to me, right? that this is not a solution right. um, and to dramatize not only the problem, but the fact that solutions were not being offered mm -hmm. uh, that would actually do something, would actually house homeless people or help homeless people. But it, as you were talking, I was thinking about that it, there is something similar again to forensic architecture in the because the way you're talking about it is that the homeless people, uh, the homeless vehicle allowed people to give some kind of testimony about their lives yes. and the conditions. And that's what forensic architecture is doing differently, definitely differently, but it's collecting evidence so that it can testify at trials, right? Yes. 
Yes. Uh, that can, you know, and it has to be helped to speak, right? Because it doesn't speak itself. Yes. Yes, I agree. Uh, well, no, I learned from you, Rosalind, also how to understand this vehicle. Uh, one of the things you said was that uh, its utopia is based on the hope that its function will render it obsolete. Am I right? Yes, that sounds familiar. So um, that's another uh, aspect of interrogative design that somehow it leads to its own uh, extension. Mm -hmm. the, I mean, it wants to stop functioning and be replaced by something, uh, you know, really effective. Because it shouldn't have to exist in the first place. Yes. Yeah. So, so uh, I added so, another term to this uh, because I was I grew up as a, funk, a kind of person who was um, into function, form follow function, <laughs> the functionalism of, uh, uh, I mentioned this before here, uh, not so much Bauhaus, but Ulm School of Design. It was called, uh, they invented the systematic design methodology. Uh, so functionalism reached in a very more precise and pseudo-scientific form. Uh, so so I, I decided to also to use the term scandalizing functionalism. Hmm. Very, one of your brilliant terms. <laughs> well, really, I'm... that I've learned so much from. Uh, so do you think we can move on now a little bit to monuments sure. I, and your projections onto monuments? Uh, okay. I know you talked about it, monuments, this uh, earlier session, so I hope I'm not going to repeat anything that was said there. I, so I, I, this is the uh, project I don't show very often, but it is part of the exhibition. Uh, at Graduate School of Design. It's a video. It's a fragment of uh, my first projection that was uh, uh, not slide projection, but video uh, uh, through which people could speak uh, through monument. So that was uh, quite a long time ago. Um, when was that? Yeah, there was a, a projection mm. on old city hall in Krakow uh, as a part of Andrzej Wajda festival. And that projection, uh, also important that this is one of the largest, some people say the largest public space, physical public space in Europe, uh, in the middle of Krakow. And uh, uh, inside of this, of course, there's some, something else, big kind of uh, uh, a cloth hall. Uh, but in it, at the center, there is a lonely tower, which is what is left of some city hall that was uh, burned a long time ago. It's a Gothic, Gothic tower. Uh, so when I was asked to maybe come up with some project for this festival. First, I thought of, uh, of slides, plus, because that's what I was doing. But uh, the, the person who was in charge of this festival, who organized around him the festival, organized Andrzej Wajda, the, the famous filmmaker, director, uh, he was showing his films on this plaza using video projectors. So I, I asked him, could I actually use your projectors, but also become a director at the same time. <laughs> Not as, as the way you are directing, but somehow directing the, the process of, of animation of this, of this tower with gestures and voices of people who have lots of things to say about what's happening to them at night. So uh, th this was a truly night projection because uh, whoever was speaking for the tower was talking about events that were frightening very often, painful, there was torturous events, very difficult events, all happening at night. 
So, but it's the important thing is that people are looking at this tower. It is a center. That's where people meet. Everybody knows this tower. So, in a sense, this tower lives in every person in Krakow, and and every person lives in this tower. It, every, everyone identifies with this tower as a lonely, you know, romantic figure, uh, surrounded by all of those things, you know, the problems, issues, and this, this certain kind of uh, project, mental projection is happening on this tower by everybody. So by, by, by uh, with the use of video projectors, I realize I'm creating a condition that somebody else will live in this tower or will, will speak from inside of this tower. So people will have to accept that other person as a roommate in, in, in their own psychic. So that meeting, meeting people who are speaking to the tower, there is, I think it got to the bones of people uh, because the, somehow the tower was already in their bones. So I was very surprised by the impact of this work. Uh, somebody who was standing there in the middle of the crowd responding to it uh, without knowing that I am behind this project uh, she said, how, how is this possible that people uh, uh, believe the tower, but don't believe people? But in Polish, it sounds very, very, very interesting linguistically. Jak to jest, że ktoś wierzy, 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 a nie wierzy człowiekowi. Wiara, believe, and tower is the same word in Polish. So, as you see, there were lots of people who came. It was because that's the place to go, to come. This is actually um, the perfect. Uh, but um, I, I have a video. Just wanted to. Oh, I'm sorry. Go see, ahead. To let, let the tower speak. Dziecko, które obudzi się, będzie płakało. Kiedy będzie płakało, on będzie bardziej zdenerwowany. Zaatakuje to dziecko, które on nie przytulni, tylko odrzuca. Odrzuca jako coś, co płacze. I potem przychodzą dni, kiedy tata nie pije, kiedy tata bierze na ręce, kiedy tata naprawi rowerek, I nieważne, że wcześniej on ten rowerek zepsuł, kopiąc go. Dla dziecka jest ważne, że ten tata jest dobry, że ten tata naprawił rower, że ten tata zrobił hamulce. Przychodzi noc, tata grozi, że wszystkich w domu pozabija. I znowu dziecko nie wie, co z tym ojcem się stało. Ten ojciec przecież jest taki dobry, a teraz ten ojciec jest taki Też się zastanawia, a może to ja byłem niedobry? Może ja coś zawiniłem? Może to ten ojciec przeze mnie jest taki zły? Zaczyna się wewnętrzny dramat dziecka, które nie wie, jak zadowolić ojca, którego tak naprawdę kocha. Kocha go za to, że jest jego ojcem, a przy tym boi się. Lubię zamykać mnie w małych pomieszczeniach, takich jak toaleta i gasić światło. Potem, gdy dowiedział się, że panicznie boję się szczurów, tak nigdy tego nie zapomnę. Przyszedł pijany, był zły, spałem. Było późno, już po północy. Rozkazałbym, zniosła zakiszone ogórki do piwnicy. Byłam przerażona, płakałam, prosiłam, ale gdy już zaczął mnie szarpać i patrzeć na mnie takim wzrokiem, dzieci mówiły, że tatuś patrzy i uśmiecha się jak bestia. Zeszłam do piwnicy w milczeniu, niosąc siatkę pełną słoików. Byłam w koszuli nocnej, nie miałam nawet pantofli. Ale nie czułam wtedy, że ich nie mam. 
Nie to było najgorsze. Za każdym razem schodził razem ze mną i gdy układałam słoiki na półkach, wyzywał, poniżał mnie. Nie chciałam go prowokować, więc milczałam. Zeszłam ostatni raz, zamknął mnie na kłódkę i zgasił światło. I wtedy dowiedziałam się dlaczego. Dlatego, że nie czekałam na niego z obiadem. Dostałam karcer. Tłumaczył, że on miał tydzień karceru i to często, a ja mam tylko do rana. Każdy najmniejszy szmer to dla mnie była chmara szczurów, które miały nadejść i mnie zjeść. Widziałam je... Widziałam je łażące po mnie. Wtedy miałam zakodowane, że Nikt nie może się dowiedzieć o niczym. Um, I just want to take a little swerve here and uh, talk about the way you approach monuments. And I'm thinking about um, not this particular work, um, but something more like the homeless projection from 1986 um, or the war Veterans Memorial, uh, Abraham Lincoln, and um, the other one that you did in uh, Madison Square Park. Um, because obviously your work with monuments takes on a new relevance today when there's a lot of very vigorous debate about um, taking down racist colonialist monuments, right? And um, so those who are opposed to these monuments generally call for them to be physically removed, uh, to be physically taken down. For example, uh, Decolonize This Place recently put out a poster uh, titled How to Take Down a Monument, and it gives very detailed, explicit instructions about how to physically take down a monument, um, which of course I support, you know, people who want to take down Confederate monuments. It's not, but I, I, um, I'm thinking that you have a very different way of taking down monuments, uh, what you call your symbol attack. Uh, well, you called it that, I think in the public projection essay that you wrote, um, which I think was like 1983, or was it later? Yes. Okay. Um, and there you said something um, about your symbol attack and what it does. Um, because I was thinking that unlike people who call for the literal removal or destruction of a monument, your work sort of destroy or take down monuments in a way by bringing them to life. This was <laughs> not that you want to take down this uh, city hall monument, but it's an example of the animation of the monuments that your projections and uh, video projections produced. Um, and you've written, and I believe this was in the um, 
leaflet brochure that accompanied the homeless vehicle projection exhibition at 49th Parallel in 1984, you wrote, there's nothing so disrupting or astonishing as, the si as a sign of life in a monument. And I'm wondering if you could talk about that statement and elaborate on it more. Why is it so disrupting? Why is it so troubling? Why does it produce such disease or disquiet to see the monument come to life? Well, it's difficult to answer this question. Uh, it's much easier to feel this way than to have a theoretical answer, understanding the process. Okay, there are various ways to see it. One is that what if a uh, uh, Lincoln Monument in Washington Memorial could actually see what's happening today with the Union. So I think it's worth imagining uh, what would he say or what kind of comment would it be? Uh, maybe he would just not come to life to see it. Uh, so first, as long as uh, we only imagine it, that's fine, but actually to see his eyes blinking and <laughs> trying to, or even trying to say something, that's definitely frightening because it is also something to do with ourselves as monuments, because we are monuments to our own uh, lofty uh, visions, hopes, but also traumatic events, terrible memories. So, uh, there is some relationship between statues, especially, and humans. We share the kind of strange condition between being animated and inanimated, between life and death. Uh, so, as long as they are there, not doing anything, uh, that's fine. But once they come to life, that's, there's a fear. But I also have to say that there's a mixture of feeling, not only fear, but also one may want to laugh at the same time. So, because to make an animated animated, it also causes some kind of strange reaction in us. Uh, because we are also recognizing monumental, monumental aspects of ourselves. We are postures, we have facades, we are statues, we, we really are uh, presenting ourselves this way, uh, but suddenly uh, seeing that the building is doing the same. In fact, the building in which we walk uh, all day long, so as the being assume our condition and we assume building's condition, but the kind of architecturalization of our body and bodification of architecture. That's what I mentioned in that early writing. That was the time when I was, uh, uh, well, I encountered a very interesting reaction of the public to my very first projection in public space. Um, so I just want to bring that one image. The very first one. The very first one. Yeah, anyway, that was a projection on the uh, Scotia Towers in, uh, in, uh, in Canada. Uh, so I realized I didn't know really what was happening. It was not many people, it was night. And I realized there was some sound and I realized that a group of people were standing there and laughing. So uh, <laughs> once I realized they're laughing, that means that they are laughing. They don't know why they are laughing. When someone is laughing, it's a surprise. It's instinct. So they probably were laughing at themselves 
because they were probably working in that building that was now standing like themselves. So the sign of life, there was light projections. It was already sign of life. Well, of course, we know this from uh, our artistic tradition of surrealism and Dada. So this, there's nothing new about this. But when it comes to video, there is something new. Mm -hmm. It goes much further. Yes. I'm thinking that also insofar as traditional monuments, you know, kind of neoclassical bronze, marble monuments are embody uh, what Nietzsche called monumental history, you know, the history of the victors, the history of great men, et cetera. Um, what Walter Benjamin opposed to the tradition of the uh, victims or the tradition of the uh, oppressed, um, that insofar as monuments represent or embody this kind of history or notion of history, uh, to see them move in any way, to see a sign of life in them is to destroy their, or to question their stability and solidity and to make them vulnerable uh, and therefore to make the history that they're trying to tell or that their makers are trying to tell us vulnerable. Um, so the seeming permanence of that history, the seeming uh, uh, timelessness of it, et cetera. And it's interesting uh, that you say that we're monuments because the same thing could scare us, you know, that we uh, are not this coherent facade that we present all the time, that there are all these other things going on inside us. Um, well, I think that uh, <clears throat> monuments should receive a uh, uh, semi-human status. As much as we already are carry on semi-monumental status. Could you uh, explain that? So I think monuments are partially human, as much as we are partially monument, monu mm -hmm. monumental. It has mm -hmm. to be recognized before we simply are destroying them. In other words, if they are partially human, per perhaps that they should have some of the human rights, <laughs> as we have some of the monumental mm -hmm. rights. So I, I agree with you. If people want to destroy the monument, uh, there's just nothing I can say about it. I, I cannot question destruction of Bastille. Or, of course, that is the will of the people. Or the Vendome Column. But when there is a possibility of discussion, uh, one, our, every voice should be heard. Uh, it's not to defend necessarily the monument against destruction, but knowing more, what are we destroying? And, and because destruction itself has a commemorative value as well, it's not, it's not so simple. Okay, uh, well, just to bring an example, there is a monument of, uh, of, of Admiral Farragut in the middle of New York City in Madison Square Park. Now we are learning now that this same, this uh, leader, uh, one of the leaders of, uh, of, of civil war, um, you know, trying to contribute to the abolition of slavery, in fact, was a slave owner. And uh, in, during the civil war, he was a slave owner, so was his wife. And there was not uh, really hiding this fact. So. Uh, okay, so what we should do? Should we simply destroy the monument? Well, if the monument is partially human, and we are partially monuments, perhaps you should all look at our own hypocrisies and also recognize complexity of our own situation. We want to change things around, and we're dragging with us the past that we might actually resent. Maybe it's not so simple. I'm not saying to defend it. I'm just thinking that it is possible to, to organize around such monument truth and reconciliation events in which people will unleash all of their grievances and all of their thoughts 
but also others will come and admit their own mixed feelings about their own background and history and questions what to do with it, not to simply feel guilty, but perhaps do something in their lives so the world will, be, will not repeat catastrophes from the past. This is for monuments are for. They're supposed to give us a warning. They're supposed to say, memento, beware, uh, you know, remember, with exclamation mark. So, so that's the situation with the Farragut Monument or some a lot of the others. It's somewhat different from the uh, Confederate monuments that have that are, were basically put up as rallying yeah. points for white supremacy. I just wanted to make sure that that got course, said. Course, yeah. um, right, but I think that if what you're saying uh, is that your work on the monument, the projection is an attempt, uh, I mean, you do a lot of things, but by moving them, you wanna promote some kind of public discourse and conversation. Um, but it was starting with the projections. Uh, I mean, staying, staying with monuments, I'd like to just bring in the topic of psychoanalysis because throughout your written and your uh, visual work, it's, that work has long been informed by psychoanalytic vocabulary or terminology, um, and in very different ways. You've used psychoanalysis in very different ways, I think. So one way is that you conceive of the viewer as a, a psychoanalytic subject, as a, in the sense of a subject with an unconscious mind. Uh, so then you talk in public projection about how city dwellers, passers-by, viewers of buildings and statues. Um, they identify, that's a psychoanalytic term, right? They idealize these buildings. They, um, or they are enthralled by, et cetera. You've talking about, talked about monumental structures as father type figures. Um, so in regard to spectators, um, in regard to this way that you conceive of the spectator as a psychoanalytic subject, as a complex mental subject with an unconscious, what in that regard would be the goal of your projection, in the projections that you do in terms of addressing that spectator? Addressing the process of <clears throat> identification, I guess, with those forms, symbolic forms or statues. Yes. Uh, but in order to disidentify dis oneself, one has to first acknowledge one's identification. Yes. So I wish I could do more work in this direction because now when we're speaking, it, 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 some projects are almost being uh, born in my head, uh, which I have not done. But uh, what you are saying is definitely part of what I've done. Um, so we identify with them. We, uh, this is, of course, the example of this is, is famous poem by Pushkin on, uh, on this uh, sculptural monument in St. Petersburg of, of Peter the Great. Well, they are, they are gazing at this monument, uh, just glorifying it and trying to imagine oneself in being on that pedestal. It's the beginning of the poem. Hmm. And then, of course, uh, uh, there was a, uh, when this uh, person who was worshiping his onions moved back, he realized something was happening behind his back. And he, he, he realized this big, uh, uh, big uh, general on a horseback is just descending from the pedestal and trying to run after him. <laughs> so he is running through the city and you know, this is, this is a, one of the most uh, beautiful and the best written poems I ever <laughs> managed to read 
I what's the title? Yes. What's the title of the poem? I don't know how this in English. It's a uh, writer, I think it's called, uh, um, it's definitely called, uh, the title is The Rider. It's actually bronze or, or, or copper rider. It's amazing. Sounds yeah. amazing. I've it's, never read it. Right. So this is something that stays in my mind. Um, that identification is a dangerous thing. You know, you might actually be <laughs> losing life as a result. If we want to identify with the statues in the war memorials, for example, you know, we are just straight going to, mm -hmm. uh, to be sent to the front line and immediately die heroically. Yes. Yes. So, so, so the perpetuation so, of wars is done by war memorials in a very complex way. You know, that will, will take me long, long, uh, lots of time to explain how I see this process. Some, they say in Poland, my old country, that somewhere between war memorials, there is Poland. So that's where I'm coming from. Mm hmm. Well, I wanted, to, I don't know if we're going to have time, but I do want to go on to talk about your war work. But I want to stay with the psychoanalysis a little bit longer, which will lead to the war work. But um, because another way in which you use psychoanalysis is that in addition, and you've already demonstrated this today, that in addition to approaching the viewer or the spectator as a psychoanalytic subject, sometimes you talk about the monument or the building as a psychoanalytic subject itself, right? Um, so you talk about, and I think this is a, a kind of metaphorical use of psychoanalysis that you um, you talk about buildings or the monuments in particular, unconscious, having an unconscious, right? And um, so the homeless projection, you said, I think in that I wrote it down here, something about one of the goals of your projection and this is your quote, to liberate the problem of the homeless from the unconscious of the architecture, right? So you're using that language. And then here comes the quote. <laughs> You've said that the symbol attack uh, has to happen at night because that's when the monuments are uh, sleeping and having their nightmares, right? They're sort of released from their everyday activity so, um, you know, the nightmare or the dream as the royal wrote to the unconscious, uh, you're using those ideas. Um, and is, so is it too fanciful for me to say that um, in some way you're acting as, again, it's a metaphor, acting as a psychoanalyst with the monuments? in the sense of attempting to kind of probe beneath the appearance of coherence and the appearance of solidity and um, uncover the, uh, what the monument's repressing, that is it repressing into the unconscious and how that unconscious is constantly exerting pressure against the surface. Is I, that I, yeah, it's a beautiful put? But you know, this I am also a practical. Uh, I'm a pra practicing artist, as they say. So, I this psychoanalysis also is therapeutic practice. What did you just say? It's a what? therapeutic therapeutic yes. practice. Therapeutic, right? So it is not a psychoanalysis of uh, in a kind of research. Rich, uh, research uh, uh, exploring uh, the way uh, our psychic world works only, it has actually an objective to heal. And you've spoken, you've used the term memorial therapy. Yes. Right. And I actually was planning to ask you to, you know, unpack that phrase, uh, which is so interesting. Well, First of all, memorials, monuments are, uh, I see many, and my heart is with them because I see that they suffer. 
they suffer because no, not all of them, of course, deserve my, my my very positive feelings about them. But they, even criminals, suffer. They suffer because uh, because they see something and they they cannot do anything about it. They they see things they cannot say the word. You know, they. Um, uh, they cannot even turn their eyes, you know, they, they, they cannot uh, reprimand us or nor they can uh, congratulate us for great or wrong things we do. They, they are uh, imprisoned somehow in that frozen, uh, frozen form. Uh, so uh, I think in that sense, yes, I identify with their condition myself. <laughs> and I see that some people also do that. It's not, uh, I, when it happens to me, I'm sure it happens to masses of people. The, the same kind of uh, dialogue or uh, empathy, in maybe in some ways, uh, maybe it's stretched to say that, with the monuments. So, um, you know, they are also there exposed to, to, you know, to elements, to to terrible weather conditions and so forth. So they all say are strangely similar to some of us, especially homeless people, you know, who are live on their steps. So the monument is uh, looking at them. Some of those monuments and building uh, just in name of some lofty hopes of some better future for society, for everybody. There are some civic leaders there. You know, they all standing, they're looking at this, they cannot say anything. So I think that uh, to help the monument to survive this, it it's, would be good if, if the monument could say something. Or we could ask, for example, the whole homeless person to, to actually speak through the monument. And so become, so we we'll prevent this monument from being what Alois Regal said, homeless of history. So there's actually um, two ways that you, the term memorial therapy, and they're related. One is that you're talking about therapy for the poor monuments who are mute in many ways, who have been muted and yeah. nobody looks at them and all of that stuff. But aside from that, and then there's therapy through memorials, a kind of healing yeah. that you can right. use the memorials so to. Those, those who... Uh, uh, who agree or who have some will and the imagination to animate the monument, to speak through the monument, mm -hmm. they must animate themselves first. So if there is a, a relationship between the monumental co condition of the person and, and per personal condition of the monument, uh, then one could, could see that there is some tra traumatic, traumatic conditions they share so the, somebody who cannot speak, find expression and words for unspeakable experiences is the monument to his or her own trauma, well, as Judith Fairman mentioned in her right. lectures. The, so, um... yeah, so, that, so, the, so, in order, so that is some kind of identification with this frozen monument in time. But if you want to speak through the monument, you have to find enough force, strength, and emotionally charged speech to, to really overcome that stillness, coolness, and motionlessness of the monument. I think, you know, when you describe this, the uh, Hiroshima projection, in which you project hands of people who are testifying, really, to their experiences um, in Hiroshima after the bombing, uh, and the way the hands appear to be the hands of the atomic dome, which stands behind. So there's a, this merging of the muted monument and the muted trauma victim. And it, it, both are speaking in this projection. <laughs> Mushiro
その人間がこの川の水面に見えないだけ死骸が浮いてたんです川の流れは神から流れてそしてまたそのドームの前を通ってそして左に上がりますねそして54年前は人々は川に飛び込みました「助けてください」と手を動かしましたでも帰ってきません沈みましたでも It's a very wrenching work in many ways.、Um, so, yes, I think that、uh, is a perfect example of what you've been saying about memorial therapy, and,、um, which is a very original term and also a very serious term. Well, the the clinicians, clinicians know very well that there is nothing worse for a traumatized person not to be able to share,、uh, even with simple words, about what one is going through internally. So,、uh, public space being seen as a therapeutic environment,、uh, because that's that, if that is open enough, at least it has that hope. Or utopia in it, that it could be, should be open. So, speaking about the public space,、uh, as, uh, and is finding the words in the public testimony is the way to live in a healthier life with, some, with one's trauma. Also, quoting Judith Herman.、Uh, so, in this way, therapy through monument. It has something to do with paresia, paresia. In fact, this word is being used by, in therapeutic also situations, but usually when the patient is brave and in speaking, telling the truth to the doctor. But in, in fact,、uh, but, but also it is acknowledged that、uh, when someone becomes an agent, that sees one's agency to speak on behalf of others, not on behalf of oneself. Mm-hmm. What also leads to more to healthier life with one's trauma? The,、um, yeah, I think it's so important to emphasize this fact that public recognition is、uh, a crucial element of recovery from trauma. And that,、uh, I think, applies not just to individual trauma, but to collective traumas.、Uh, Christoph, I hate to say it, but we're out of time. <laughs> um, but, and I, we haven't even gotten to the abolition of war, which I really wanted to talk about.、Um, but I was told that,、um, and I think we should open this up to questions from people. And、uh, Dan was going to take over at this point. There, there's been mostly、uh, comments. If you, if you wanted to continue and jump right into abolition of war, there's time for that. Really? Yeah. Okay. How much time? Like five or 10 minutes. Okay. Well, we'll try to keep it within that.、Um, so, you unveiled this project, the proposal for the Arc de Triomphe、uh, World Institute for the Abolition of War. I think it was 2010, right? In Harvard Design Magazine. And,、uh, and then later, two years later, in the book, The abolition of war. That's a kind of accompaniment to the project.、Um, and continuing again with this theme of psychoanalysis,、uh, it plays a very big role in this project and particularly in the book.、Um, although the Institute contains, a kind of, I think, a psychoanalytic research institute or something. but We don't have to talk about that. But in the book, you ask, what is the unconscious of the war memorial? You know, something that you say, have asked now about a number of monuments. So, so what is the unconscious of the Arc de Triomphe?、Um, and, uh, and then you use the term unwar instead of peace. 
as an alternative to war. I'm just putting out a whole bunch of questions for you. And, and yeah. then just one more, okay? You have oh. also said, and I think this is really, you know, so important that we, we have to disarm, the goal of this project is to disarm the war memorial. And then you've said, we also have to disarm ourselves because yeah. we too are war memorials. And I just wanna know, you know, what okay. you so the, the sim simplest, uh, simplest entry to be unconscious of war memorial is all of the things that the memorial is not saying. Enormous amount of people killed by enormous amount of people who are killing. Enormous amount of people who suffer trauma, cross-generational trauma. So to the point that uh, actually their entire uh, identity is being formed through generations by the way they behave during the war, before the war, and after the war. That's how the value of that citizen is being measured. So all of the things, the incredible cost of war, first of all, is never in those memorials, the true cost of war. You know, if people could only learn that one, perhaps they will think twice before uh, be, being fascinated, in fact, intoxicated uh, or by the glory, beauty and grandeur of those structures and uh, also imagine themselves to be next in line to heroically die for the lost uh, object of love, you know, the nation or, or something. So, so the sacrifice and perpetuation are the two most common words in those memorials. So that means the, the unconscious is what, what I'm talking about is actually already <laughs> just saying what's not there, but, but you know, it could be there and it should be there and it must be there. So the wars will stop continuing. You know, so the absurd idea that the only way, path to peace is through war, which is exactly what this memorial is, is, yes. is saying step by step, it is a perpetuation, like this uh, you know, circle in which the cars are driving around. There is a kind of a circular perpetuation of war. So they are uh, war machines. So that's clear uh, to me. Uh, but uh, you ask other questions that uh, I already keep forgetting because it's probably uh, already partially in what I'm saying. Well, or on war. We, yes, we are war memorials because we are, uh, our upbringing is all what I was just saying. We are all identifying. Our identity is related to war. So, how to un war oneself? This is, uh, you know, all truly a psychological issue, but also that's what art can do, and artists can do. Uh, it's just to to really uh, get closer to the truth, you know, about how much we are the f the fabric, the product of war, and how much we're ready to stage another war, in some ways, or endorse perpetuation of war romanticize it, glorify it. I think that um, it may be harder, a much more difficult project to get to the unconscious of the inner war memorial, <laughs> us, right? Than that of Arc de Triomphe, because you can display, you know, and show all the deaths and et cetera. Um, but we're not just, invested in war because of our social conditioning. We are, because we do live in a culture of war. And so that of course is very important, but psychoanalytically it's because of our own, the destructiveness that's inherent to being human. And this is what Freud tells us about. Um, and also the possibility of regressing to earlier mental, more of barbaric mental states so that in order to disarm ourselves, I mean, we may not be able to disarm ineradicable because we can't change the fact it's ineradicable that we have this inner destructiveness, 
But if we acknowledge it and tolerate it, then we won't mobilize certain other mechanisms like getting rid of it by projecting it onto other people. And they become the, the enemy, you know, this search for enemies that goes on all the time because we want to get rid of our own destructiveness and hostility. We can't tolerate it. And therefore, when we project it outward onto others, they become bad and we can kill them, right? Is there, we construct them as bad. Um, so the other question, though, that I had asked was um, unwar, the term. Why unwar? Yeah, because peace is uh, is kind of simple work that is replacing all of the work that needs to be done, uh, not perpetuate wars. It, mm -hmm. Everybody is struggling for peace. I remember Soviet Union was struggling for peace. But the Communist Party in Poland was in continuing struggle for peace. Yes. So, uh, but you know, the, nobody really was talking about war. Everybody was talking about peace. So how can you even think of peace if you don't know what war is? How how to unwar the culture? That's what, a real psychoanalytic oh, approach. Yeah, we call culture. It is no no other culture really. I mean, you look at the history of culture in Europe. All history of culture in Europe is a culture of war. Now, the European Union was created only for one pur purpose: to stop those wars, whether well, that by by uh, political means and economical means. But the, the objective is stop the war. But it did not do. It can not handle well the culture. The culture in member states still has too many movements, people, politicians, parties. They still are trying to uh, somehow imagine another war because of nationalism. You know, that is definitely growing problem in the European Union. So Monet, uh, the founder of this idea of, of, of European Union, before he died in the in, in some interview, he said, if I was to do it again, I would start with culture. So the, uh, that's, the, that's uh, why I think that we have things to do, the artists who contributed to culture of war enormously. We, were, we are creators of those structures with architects. You know, we, 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 all our talents were used to create this kind of uh, uh, you know, war machine. So, so artists why not do like, something opposite? Yeah. Exactly. They, you know, the artist is in a kind of unique position of creating objects that can encourage disidentification right. and, you know, empathy or whatever. Um, but also, and I think you see that, say this somewhere, that unwar, um, peace does not imply disarmament. Peace, uh, the country stay armed, you know, mutual deterrence and all of that was considered peace. And William James, I think it was, who said that in modern mouths, peace means preparedness for war. So unwar is such a great replacement. First, first of all, just for its defamiliarizing effect, but also because it means something very different. So Dan, are you stopping us? There is a there's a couple questions. One is in particular to that image. There was a question about the design, um, and I'm going to add on to the question itself. The question was how do tectonics figure into your Arc de Triomphe or Abolition of War Institute? But also, I I know the project goes much further beyond the tectonics into actually creating an institute one that is research-based, it is teaching-based, and it, and it permeates the, the program. It drove the programmatic layout of that as, an, as a monument. So if you could talk a little bit more about the design of Abolition of War, maybe bring the image back. This is a, a design. He has had something to do with the program that needs to be designed. Well, this is just a, a kind of scaffolding, a skeleton. Um, be, maybe just a hint that it, it, that it is, should be temporary because we should actually end those wars 
So this thing could be or should be dismantled. But at the same time, it is uh, designed is also to bring people close to the surface, to all of those reliefs and sculptures, uh, to to confront one to eye, to 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 bring oneself to this so close that it will stop having such an impact on us. Because once you are so close to this uh, monstrous uh, sculpture. You know, uh, you know, when you look at the distance of uh, from the distance of this of this uh, sculpture, you, you would think this person should be actually in mental hospital uh, <laughs> because it's it's completely, victory. Yeah, it's and apart for this kind of behavior and expression, people are awarded the highest honor uh, when it is happening uh, at war. Why in the, in between the wars, you just end up in prison or in mental hospital. So this, but it isn't close to it, it's important. So the design here is about helping people to establish critical connection. And it's maybe a, a, a space for programs, uh, for discussions, for a kind of laboratory to undo this culture of war and also to discuss the issues, to meet each other and prevent recurrence of conflicts. We're talking about peace, there, is, uh, there, are, there are two kinds of notions of peace, positive peace and negative peace. Uh, the, the good peace is the one when we continuously discuss and bring all of the issues that bothers us that actually led to previous wars and confront them you know, the negative peace is the one when we just don't want, when we are peaceful, that we don't want to talk about it. You know, we just do other things because it's too difficult to talk about this and then eventually create conditions for another outbreak of war very easily to happen if, if you, so that, that, that's something of this and all of the other information about that is completely hidden, that is the, that is not exposed about the real aspects of war. All of this should be there. But this is also not me who should design all of this. I think the process is different. It should involve all kinds of groups and people who will have their own knowledge to this. There's lots of work done in, uh, uh, in this unwar, on this unwar front. We don't have monuments to people who prevented war to happen so much. We only have monuments to people who staged the wars, either heroically lost them or heroically won them. So that all of those things could be there. So design is more it's in a, a space, potential space for all of those various programs. That's why it's so skeletal, you know. At this stage, so I, I, I wish I could work on this with, with a team of people who will start really designing programs. Could you show the uh, image, the previous one, where you'd show it from the outside? Mm -hmm. No, the first one you showed. That, well, that's perfect. Um, you know, because another thing that it does, of course, is to make to isolate this monument and make people look at it as a kind of specimen to be studied you know it has a it gets this strange sort of brechtian appearance as a strange object um i just wanted to insert that we have like one final quick question just a few minutes left um i'm gonna try to summarize it um well i'll it's a it's a multi-part question but this one I'll, I'll just say uh what sort of relationship do you see christoph between the physical public spaces of a city and online public spaces if online communication be, can be called public well I, 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 could you repeat this question i couldn't hear you well what sort of relationship do you see between the physical public spaces of a city in online public spaces, so it's the physical agora versus the digital agora. If online communication can be called public, 
Yeah, that was asked, and people are asking themselves this for a while. Um, I always feel there is a connection between those two public spaces that cannot be questioned, can only be made. Um, we, can, we must use all the connections between this electronic, digital, or virtual, and physical. Because uh, you know, we already know well, okay, for example, if uh, during the, uh, after September 11, there was a massive demonstration in New York City against bombing of Iraq. Uh, at, but we didn't, nobody gave us a space, physical space to assemble. There were some problems. And I realized that enormous amount of people were just communicating via cell, uh, cell phones or listening to speeches. All of the movement of people were actually directed via media. There's, there's enormous amount of historical event in physical public spaces that could not have, have happened so efficiently in, in so impactful way without media. So one media helps another media and the opposite is true too. The, at the same time, there's so much media in public space, in physical space, it cannot be more right now. So, so as I mentioned this before, the only way to handle this actually to, uh, uh, to take charge of media in questioning this, encountering it, and uh, superimposing one media uh, uh, transmission onto another one, and maybe create something, some dialogue between those superpowers who speak through public space and our own attempts to speak using our media it doesn't have to be as horrifying and powerful, but still. There is. So I am I feel there is that connection has to be more acknowledged in design, especially in graduate on the graduate school of design, perhaps more than we see at this stage. So in a way, this Arc de Triomphe, the Institute, actually should be very much of a media project. Uh, you know, installed in this uh, in this structure, uh, I'm just uh, would like to work on this more. And uh, anyone who wants to join me, please give me a call. Uh, I am very, I'll be very happy to uh, uh, to to move ahead with this project, uh, informed by all of the time in which I. We've been learning so much about media. Well, it does bring us to time and to conclusion for our, our time together today in this, in this particular session. In some ways, it feels like we just got started. You know, um, I want to thank Rosalind for, for joining us and, and leading us into a discussion. That oh, we Charlotte is making her <laughs> <laughs> Charlotte's making her appearance. So. Right. Yeah. Um, with a sort of phrase, memorial therapy. It, it was uh, a, a really fantastic um, deep dive on Christoph's work in memorials in general and monuments and leading us to the abolition of war project of Christoph. So thank you. Well, I, I'm going to say that uh, it was animation of monuments of a solid uh, form. There is one thing to, to, to remember that uh, the past cannot be changed. It's there. The issue is how are we going to live with this past and move on with our lives? So the projection, for example, stands exactly for that movement ahead. It's actually its projection forward. Uh, but also one must acknowledge at the same time that the past is there. And also hopefully we should do something so the horrib horrible aspects of that past will not repeat themselves. Uh, that uh, might be true with all kinds of uh, projections I'm doing and all structures that I am uh, engaging and all people 
who are part of that engagement, the so-called participants. Well, thank you, Christoph. I think it's a great way to put an end point on, on this entire discussion. Um, thank you for creating conditions for this discussion. Yes, <laughs> this thank you. Of course, uh, we will continue this, not only between uh, Rosalind and myself, or between you, Dan, and myself, but also people who will visit our exhibition. Uh, of you, you, are, you are such a great artist in designing those exhibitions. There's so many layers there, so many ways to inspire discussion. So I hope this will be our internal life with the show and my own life with my own doings this is another issue, but also the public come from outside and join us. Excellent. Well, thank you, everyone. Thanks um, to both of you. It's been a yeah. pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Hope Charlotte feels better. I think she is better now. <laughs> thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye.